It's uh, 6.30, so we're going to get rolling here. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, welcome to the Ward 6, December 1st, MPA meeting. Uh, my name is Mills Forney. I'm a, a new member of the steering committee, so I'm excited to be here and moderate my first uh, MPA session here. Um, I'd like to kick things off with a um, call for any announcements from the group, or online, for that matter. I'd like to read a yeah. post that was published in today's Front Porch Forum. It's okay, you got to get near a microphone. You got to get near a microphone. I got to get near a microphone. How's this? Yep. That's okay, good. cool. All right. My name is Bill Riley. I'm a resident of 254 South Union Street. I moved into the neighborhood in uh, 19 November of 1978. So I've been here for a while. And I'm here tonight to... Uh, read you a post that was that that I composed and was published today in uh, in uh, this evening's front front porch forum and I'm going to read it so I so I everything's intact and it's somewhat coherent so here it goes and it, it has to do with 242 Main Street and Memorial Auditorium so neighbors this Friday marks a deadline for proposals for the adaptive use of Memorial Auditorium. A proposal to include a revised 242 Main as part of any reuse project has been submitted by a group headed by Jim Lockridge, Big Heavy World, a Howard Street based nonprofit founded to pursue and promote Vermont music. For more than 30 years, 242 Main in the lower level of Memorial, Auditor Memorial Auditorium was an all ages teen centric drop in center organized and funded by the city of Burlington's youth office. It was started during Bernie's administration. With program driven by teens, it became America's longest running all ages punk rock review for local and national bands. 242 was a teen sanctuary where he anchored in the hearts of thousands over seven, several generations of thousands over several generations, excuse me, that gave young people a community that was mutually respectful, value oriented, with goal, with the freedom to pursue passions and explore goals. Unfortunately, 242 Maine was closed by the city in 2016 due to the deteriorating condition of Memorial Auditorium. Regretfully or neglectfully, no alternative space was ever provided. It was just closed. Please, when the time comes, support the resurrection of 242 Main. What I'm gonna read next is a, uh, is a quote from a response in 2018 to a Save 242 Main petition. This is from a former participant at 242, quote, the youth of Burlington deserve a space to call their own in which they can thrive creatively, emotionally, and become adjusted to the importance of their community. Uh, for deeper insights, there's, uh, there's more details on this past Monday's Vermont Digger, and you're going to be able to read the, uh, the full uh, uh, petition or, or the full plan for Memorial Auditorium, it'll probably be a bit, it's, it's going to be um, submitted tomorrow and it'll probably be available next week. But this is something that's really important to the use of our community. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else? Any other announcements you'd like to make or share? <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Farid. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I was here uh, at the last NPA. Um, with an announcement about uh, Proposition Zero, which is a petition uh, to change the city charter uh, to allow voters to propose and pass uh, ordinances uh, on the, through the ballot. And uh, we had a 2,000 signatures goal, uh, which will get up in the March, uh, on the March ballot. And uh, I'm happy to announce that we have uh, about 2,500 signatures uh, so far. So. We will be voting on this proposal um, in uh, during the March election. Um, I also uh, want to announce today um, that we a, a second petition 
that I've been volunteering to collect uh, is for the independent community oversight of the Burlington Police Department. Uh, we still need uh, as many signatures as we can get to put this on the ballot in March. Um, I remember last month, uh, uh, Commissioner Seguino was here to talk about some of the uh, reforms that have been going on um, with the Burlington Police Department. And I see this uh, proposal to have uh, independent uh, oversight of the police as part of that rebuilding of trust in our law enforcement um, that, so that we can move forward and address um, uh, the, the larger public safety uh, questions. So I urge you to check out our website, peopleforpoliceaccountability.com and to support uh, having uh, having this conversation by uh, signing our petition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Uh, any other announcements? Do we have uh, information about the fact there's a primary uh, about to come up? Is that in the agenda tonight? Is not in our current. Okay, agenda. I just want to mention that then, and I'll send the link so you every, we can put it in our minutes. But there's a Democratic primary for South District City Council. Anybody who's watching this is a Ward Six, Ward Five member. You're eligible to vote if you're already registered. And we have there's actually a contest. Uh, Joan Shannon's our president, counselor for South District, and Jason Dandries, correct? Yeah, is is. Uh, the it's also is running. Their date? Yeah, it's uh, you, you can vote online, and uh, I think the date is December between the tenth and the fifteenth. And if you want a paper ballot, they they will give you a paper ballot, but you can vote online. So I, think I just would like to get that in minutes. I'll send the link to the committee, and then you can put it in so people can see them. Yeah, thanks for raising that. Any other announcements? Actually, just a question. Um, this is the first of these that I've ever attended. It's just terrific since I've been on South Union. So get years. a little closer to the microphone, please. What was your name as well? I'm sorry? What was your name as well? I'm Mike, Mike Rosen. I live at 283 South Union, and I'm going to come to all of these. I haven't been active enough, but um, I guess there are some people in this room who are here as in an official capacity because they hold titles or positions in this group and the rest of us are citizens would it, it be useful to me to put on this and also to have those of you who are titles in our board and say who you are so i get to know definitely have that titles might be a stretch but we're uh steering committee members for sure to help to organize these events and uh, identify the so this is the ward six NPA steering committee. correct okay. Got it. thank you yeah, yeah absolutely I would just add often steering committees have had city councilors have um, local representatives and state senators and um, school board members. I don't see any on the you know agenda tonight, but oftentimes the elected representatives too. as invitees to yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The city's website should be updated with a list of the only and only soft three names on the scoring committee for work sets. I know there's more than three of you. Yeah, that's right. That needs to be updated. That's quite bad. Um, any other announcements or questions? Oh, yeah, it's good. Good opportunity. Yeah, no, you're right. No, sir. Sure. I'm Nancy Harkins. Uh, Nelson Martel. So we're just introducing the steering committee members. Thank you. Uh, Mills Forney. In Gail's area. Thank you. Glad to have you here. And, and we have two um, members, two additional steering committee members who are not here tonight. All right. Um, any any other, other announcements or questions that we can uh, yeah, dig into our investment? All right. If not, I think it's right on time. Uh, here at. All right. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Uh, is this is the sound okay? Can you tell from here? Okay, terrific. Yes, you're good. Um, 
hi everybody I, i'd actually rather stand and, and sort of greet everybody but I, i'll stay closer to the mic uh for those who may be watching at home pull it out and stand oh, uh, there you go it makes it easier thanks yeah, i can get you a longer cable here <laughs> Perfect. I won't stroll around. I can just stand right here. This will be fine. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so uh, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, my name is John Murad. I am I'm the acting chief of police here in Burlington. Um, and I was asked to come and speak a little bit about something that we call the crisis team. So uh, as, as I'm sure everyone here knows, in, in uh, June of 2020, there was a lot of discussion about police nationally and here in Burlington. And a component of that discussion was what do we want police to do, that is armed police officers, and what do we want to try to find other ways of doing? And uh, for the police department, what that meant uh, was a, uh, a reduction in the number of, of sworn police officers. Um, and uh, in order to fill gaps in service, what we have done is, is a couple of things. We have created a new position, we have augmented an existing position, and we have created a, a model, a, a paradigm for how we respond to things. The existing position was something called the Community Service Officer or CSO. We had two. In, in history, and usually that would be one on one side of our day shift and one on the other side of our day shift. We work four 10 hour shifts a week on patrol. And that means that there are there's one day where it overlaps because four plus four is eight, not seven. So there's a day in which both of those teams, those sides of our schedule are in. Um, we have augmented that number to an allotment of 12. We currently have seven. So we have uh, seven community service officers. They are unarmed, they are unsworn, they do not have law enforcement powers, although they can write municipal tickets, and they address quality of life issues, and they are a way of trying to ensure for part of our public that they didn't want armed officers responding to everything, that we nevertheless are able to respond. The other piece that we invented, that we created new whole cloth, we based it on an existing uh, position, occupied by a woman whom I uh, admire tremendously uh, named Lacey Smith. We took her role as the community uh, affairs liaison and we turned it into our community support liaison or CSL position. Uh, I have allotted six of those. I currently only have two staff. We're working to hire others. We've got four in the pipeline right now. Lacey is no longer the community affairs liaison. She's now the community uh, support supervisor. And she supervises these positions and guides them. Uh, they work on issues around chronic mental health uh, issues, around substance use disorder, and around houselessness. And so these are the tools that we have in-house at the Burlington Police Department to address calls for service that don't automatically re require the response of an armed police officer. However, there was also a pronounced desire in the community for uh, a crisis response, something that would, would go to critical incidents, uh, usually around mental health. Our CSOs do not do that. CSOs go to noise complaints, animal complaints, non-injury traffic crashes, our CSLs do not do that. Our CSLs do a lot of follow-up work. I liken them to detectives. In the same way that if an officer goes to a person's home and that person says, uh, I've been burgled, or that person says there's an ongoing series of crimes here, the officer takes the initial report and then passes it off to detectives who are going to do the bulk of the work. An example would be the tremendous number of gunfire incidents and shootings that we experienced over the past year. That is going to be a patrol response initially, because that's who's on and who is going. And then we turn it over to detectives to do the, the longer term work. If we don't end up making an arrest in that moment, which sometimes we do, uh, we're going to turn it to detectives. Same is true of an incident involving somebody who, who maybe has caused some kind of public uh, order issue that has caused the police to be called. But the underlying causes of that public order issue may result, may relate to mental health or substance use disorder or the fact that the person is unhoused or is in need of other kinds of services. The officer responds, addresses the situation in the moment, renders everybody safe to the best of his or her ability, and then says, you know, I don't necessarily have the tools to go farther with this. Can you CSL and passes it over to our CSLs who then take over that case and begin to work with the individual as a manager? There are other things in the field that often involve our partners at Howard Center, including their street outreach team, 
And so that's uh, yet another uh, tool that we have at our disposal here in Burlington. But the city and uh, people in the city said that they wanted something that would be more crisis oriented. Currently, crisis is the purview of police. If there's going to be an element of crisis or danger, it is going to be a police response. And what we do as police officers is we will uh, call uh, street outreach if we believe that the situation can be dealt with by street outreach, or if our uh, work can be augmented by street outreach, we will call CSLs if the CSL has a knowledge of the individual. But the CSL isn't there to deal with the actual crisis at hand. They're there to deal with the sort of the aftermath of it or, or uh, addressing it after it's been rendered safe by the police. And we also work with Howard Center's first call. And first call is a part of the Howard Center that addresses critical incidents and also does uh, more extant mental health issues than street outreach necessarily. And they are clinicians. But other communities have other systems. And the more, one that has gotten the most attention, I think, although not the most research, and very little is known about how it actually works, but it's very popular because it's got a terrific name and it branded itself very well. And reporters dug into it uh, during the days of the police reform movement in summer 2020, and it gained a huge amount of attention. And that is the CAHOOTS model out of Eugene, Oregon. The CAHOOTS model involves the deployment of a clinical social worker and a person who has some sort of medical uh, expertise, usually a, an EMT or an RN, and occasionally somebody is as well uh, tasked and skilled as a paramedic, but most of the time EMTs. Um, we essentially do that right now. We do that with our health, uh, outreach workers, the street outreach team. They routinely deploy with fire joining them at the scene, but they don't co-deploy together. And the Howard re, uh, workers are not clinicians. Uh, first of all, is our clinicians. They too routinely respond with the fire department. But again, not together. They're not housed together and they're not doing that work together. And the community has said it wants something like that. So the Burlington Police Department put together an RFP or request for proposals back in spring of this past year. And that RFP went out to the public uh, to say, can you help us build a program like this? And it, it is a crisis team that would have clinicians and medical people co-responding to incidents where either police aren't necessary or police have said we responded and we don't believe we are necessary anymore and we think you would be better for it. Um, and proactive work on the part of this, this crisis team to go out and find these kinds of incidents and address them themselves. Uh, there were resp uh, people responded to the RP, including Howard Center. Uh, and we have worked to try to make the, uh, the project square, and funding has been an issue. The city and the mayor, the mayor is very supportive of this. The city council is very supportive of it. Uh, President Paul is very supportive of this. Uh, but the city's money was not what Howard Center estimated the program costing. And so we have now gone to the state, which also sent out an RFP of its own. And so while we promulgated the first RFP in the spring, we're now responding to a different RFP that the state put out with grant money that is available for these kinds of programs around the state. Um, and uh, we have submitted an RFP. We're waiting to hear back from that. I have hired an implementer to take over this work, to shepherd it in ways that, frankly, I was not able to do over the course of the summer owing to the fact that I had four murders and was being called out just about every weekend or uh, two times, you know, two times some weekends uh, in order to address shootings, in order to address uh, a tremendous uptick in different kinds of crime. And frankly, I did not move this ball as far down the uh, gridiron as I would have liked. So uh, we hired an implementer to take over that role. Uh, she was formerly our opioid coordinator when the city and the Burlington Police Department were really invested in fighting the opioid epidemic. That too is something that, that we have sort of lost a little bit of ground on, unfortunately, uh, for a variety of reasons. But um, she right now is working on this project with us. And the task now is to bring together the various the myriad uh, participants and stakeholders, including the police department, including uh, the Howard Center, including UVMMC uh, and other entities in order to really see if we can build a program like this for Burlington. The big piece is going to be what is the actual work volume? I don't know whether the work volume, what the work volume is going to turn out to be. Because we know that we have people in distress in this community. We know that substance use disorder is, is higher than it has been. Certainly our overdose numbers are, are much higher than they've ever been. But we are addressing a lot of these things through existing systems, street outreach, the CSLs now, 
uh, first call, other entities of Howard Center. Howard Center is woefully understaffed. And the other they, they want to be better staffed. They too, like we at the police department, are having a hard time finding folks. That's a problem that is sung, uh, a woeful song that is sung across the country in almost every economic sector. Uh, where do we find people? Where have people gone? Um, but uh, are we going to have enough of, of, of true crisis incidents to justify this team? That's open. That's open for discussion. But we certainly want to build the team. Our constituents have been telling us they want it. Uh, again, the mayor, uh, Council President Paul, very enthusiastic about it. And that is where we are with that. So that was that was what I was asked to do, sort of brief on that. But I'll open it up to any questions about that or anything else that is, uh, you know, has a, a public safety bent for anyone. Sir, with the uh, programs, Greg Epplerwood. All right. Oh, sure. I guess I got you everything except the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Greg Epplerwood, uh, South Union. A um, couple of questions. Um, first of all, uh, are, do you have enough detectives? Where does the funding for detectives come from? Are you having uh, enough? Uh, do you have enough of them? Um, with this program that you're developing, um, hopefully with the state fundings, be called cahoots or would you have a different name for it and and um uh and is it uh, similar to the model that uh, cahoots uh, represent thank you and great questions i'll go for the second one first no we would not call it cahoots i think cahoots is actually proprietary to the white bird clinic in eugene oregon we are calling this a crisis team um and that is the work that they do they work on crisis and uh, the burlington crisis team if someone comes around with a great uh, monitor for it, uh, that's only helpful. Uh, it can be good branding. Um, again, as I said earlier, I think a large degree of cahoots cachet comes from their terrific name. There are other programs that are being done as well. There are programs in Denver. There are programs in uh, Missouri. There are programs in, in Texas, in Houston. Uh, there are other places where we have co-deployment of clinical workers and either first responders in the form of police or first responders in the form of uh, EMTs or medical workers. Um, uh, we do, that's the, the plan here is to take on that model that Cahoots exemplifies. Cahoots is not well understood in, in a data oriented way. Um, we are actually working with a company called RTI, which is a, a data um, institute along with a couple of other municipalities around the country that are rolling out programs like this similarly. And the reason RTI is interested in getting in at the ground level with these entities, us included, is because there is not a lot of data on what Hoots has actually done and how it functions. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful to have our piece be something that is uh, going to be uh, something that can actually be studied by other municipalities trying to do the same kind of work. Um, your first question was around detectives. So. Uh, we, I think everyone knows, we, we, we used to be authorized for 105 police officers, and we routinely hovered in the very high 90s. Uh, that was changed in June of 2020, and the department was reduced from 105 authorized to 74 authorized. Um, it was reduced by attrition, not by layoff. Uh, and however, the, the police officers attrited. They attrited very, very quickly. And we lost uh, the, the number of officers, and we are now below that 74. We are actually at 62. Um, however, the, the city council in October of last year uh, raised the cap back, not to where it was, but higher than it had been. Uh, so from 105 to 60, excuse me, from 105 to 74 to 87 now. And we are looking to grow the department again from our 62 to that 87. The 25 additional officers, you know, how quickly can we do that? It's going to be a challenge. But we have a terrific budget from the city council that the mayor worked very hard to get. He's tremendously supportive of this initiative. Uh, we have a really strong police contract. Um, and so the hope is that we will be able to rebuild uh, in the course of the next, you know, hopefully not several years, hopefully few years, not several years, but it will take time. There was a lot of damage done to this police department um, with regard to headcount and resourcing, and we need to, to get it back. How many detectives do I have? I currently have 10, and that is more than I have. Uh, I'm more functional in my detective bureau than I am in my patrol bureau at the moment. I'm required by contract to have 10 detectives, and that number didn't change even as the overall headcount shrank. So the, uh, what the, the piece that has suffered the most is our patrol capacity. I have officers at the airport and I'm required by law, by federal law to have a certain number there. So I can't really reduce my footprint at the airport. I can't really reduce my detective footprint partly because of contract and partly from efficacy. 
And this past year has proven why I need good detectives. We have an 80% solve rate on our shootings where persons are struck and 100% solve rate on our murders. And that goes back many decades. This is an exemplary police department with regard to that kind of work. So I want those 10 detectives in there. But what suffers is our patrol resource. And our patrol is down right now to about 22 police officers, non-supervisory police officers on patrol. That is inadequate for a city of our size and our scope. We are working to fix that. I was just wondering whether or not the, the, the same pot of money that was reduced with the armed officers was the same pot of money of the detectives. The, 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 that's that's that 87 includes 10 detectives. That's correct. It's a singular, it's a singular sort of personnel budget for the small officers. Okay. And the, the 87 includes me, that includes the two deputy chiefs, it includes our lieutenants, our sergeants, it includes officers at the airport, it includes officers who are detectives, it includes officers who are patrol officers, and it includes the, the I have three specialized roles that I have. I, shre I used to have more specialized roles, but the first thing I, I lost are the specialized roles because when you're when you're freezing in the winter, the first thing that starts to go are your fingertips, right? Uh, and you got to bring those things in so you have your core still working. Uh, we lost our community affairs officer. We lost our emergency response officer, but I've kept our domestic violence prevention officer, incredibly important role, uh, makes life easier and work easier for other roles. And so the 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 win of of taking that officer and putting that officer on one shift on patrol is not worth the loss of a person who is able to follow through domestic violence cases, which are, are uniquely difficult. Um, and uh, so we've kept our DVPO. We have a recruiting officer because recruit, if we can't recruit, we are simply going to wither. Um, and our challenge right now is to retain the officers we've got to stop our blood loss and then to regrow. And that recruiting officer is incredibly important for that. Um, and so th those are, are sort of the positions that we have that are outside the uh, the regular roles of either patrol or detectives or airport. All right, we have about two minutes left. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so any other questions uh, for Chief Muirhead? Sir. Just very quick, and it's probably way too long. So give your microphone. Cover it. Um, yeah, so we've got police. Um, Women service officers, community affairs liaisons. We've got this crisis team that we're talking about. Um, it would strike me as very difficult. I'm just out of curiosity, three sentences or less. Something not my forte, something but I'll try. Something, you know, at which level to address. That's a tree. That's not for you as the caller. You call nine one one and let dispatch know, and dispatch will triage it. And, and it'll be triaged both by dispatch, and if not by dispatch, it goes to a supervisor. We have implemented a priority response model. I started it in May of 2021. I modified it in May of 2022. It limits what we go to. We do not go to as many things as we used to. You can't reduce something by 50% and expect it to do what it used to do. So uh, our model, uh, and it's, it's available online, you can look at it, you can see it, takes the 120, 130 call categories that we have in our, our computer-aided dispatch system called Valcor. And it says, these are the ones that police will go to no matter what. These are the ones that they go to when they can. These are the ones that they probably rarely go to. Here are some that we're only sending CSLs to, excuse me, not CSLs, CSOs, and the, the community service officers, noise, uh, animal complaints, non-investigatory crashes. And here's some that are, ha that are gonna be online. That if, you, if it happens to you when you call, you're gonna be told to do it online. And that stinks. It stinks. I hate it. I hate that people are, are calling, asking for police to come, which used to be our default. We sent police to everything. It didn't matter whether it was a life safety incident or whether it was late reported vandalism. A cop would come to your home and find you and take that report. That is not the case anymore. It's just not something that we can do. And so that's, that's how we're addressing those kinds of issues. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Let me take one more question, maybe. Oh, you go. You go, ahead. go ahead, Bob. It's been reported several times that there's disagreements on the methodology of how Sarah George decides what is prosecutable and are not with your police. Are, are you in personal contact with her and do you work out those details? So I, I have lunch with uh, the state's attorney uh, pretty regularly, one, uh, once every two, three months. Uh, it's been a while because of the campaign. Uh, it's been more difficult for us to meet owing to uh, her campaign. Um, but uh, we need to get back in, in the, the swing of having those regular meetings. And those meetings are opportunities for us to talk about these things. Um, 
you know, some of her policies are, are clearly stated. She's articulated uh, elaborate memos around what she thinks is, is the threshold for uh, vehicle theft uh, and prosecuting that for other kinds of uh, criminal possession of property. Um, and then there are, you know, she and I share uh, a belief that, that many instances of mental health uh, even when there's criminality that ensues because of a person's, a person's mental health, are not appropriate for a criminal justice outcome, but ought to have a, uh, a, psych a psychiatric outcome. Our problem is we don't really have that as a state anymore. We do not have a, a custodial psychiatric uh, health care capacity, and we default to jail. And one place where I, I do believe she and I disagree a bit, and, and we've I've spoken to her about this, is that when I when that when that disconnect happens, I'm going to default to what is going to keep the public safe and what is going to work for victims, and I'm less concerned with what the person who did these things uh, is how that person is. I want that person treated compassionately. I certainly want my officers to treat that person compassionately. I want your police to be good, uh, you know, caring police, but. What I care about is the public safety element of that and not necessarily saying I'm not going to jail this person just because jail is going to be worse for this person. If jail is worse for the person, but better for the society and the public, that's where I'm going to go. And that is a difference. But I don't control that decision. I We arrest who we can arrest uh, when appropriate, cite who we can cite, and we do what we can to intervene in incidents as they happen. And then we let it fall where it falls with regard to both prosecution, with regard to the courts. And a significant component of, of what we've seen over the past two years with regard to a slowdown in prosecution has not been the prosecutor. It has been the fact that the courts until August, this August, were still under a COVID emergency when the rest of the state had abandoned it more than a year earlier. All right. Thank you very okay. much, Chief Miran. Thank you. Uh, for your time and for your service. We appreciate it. Um, next up, we have um, the Burlington Community Justice Center, a parallel justice program. Is Bridget here? Ah, great. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, work toys, we just, it might take us a minute to set up. So. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I imagine that's all right. You know, people can check in with another and chat for a bit, and then we'll let the call know who's ready. Right? Take a break. Oh, it's over on. Uh, for the folks who are here, I was just about to do that. Yes, it's a good idea. Uh, there, for folks who are here, there's fantastic pizza and then samosas as well from Farid, right? Uh, so thank you very much for running that. Just <laughs> Yeah, but there's no reason. Okay. The audio is now Yes. 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 Sure. So let me get hooked up to the Wi-Fi. You know what? Actually, <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, we just we have some animations on the PowerPoint. Uh, I don't know. We need to be. Able can that to really be real? I mean, I heard I've read that too. But can yeah. that really be a real thing that she said? I can't believe. No, it. I believe that she signed it. Break out. I mean. <laughs> Kids are the to the Oh, oh yeah. Hi, how are you? Oh, oh, you know, that's the, <laughs> what is that? Oh, is that the same? 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 Is
they have to figure this out. They can't just have a bill. Because the people who have a bill, you know, who is these things change, right? So, they're not closed with certain things. They should be opening up. The timing of the two of them should be telling us what pressure on the courts go. There is a but all right, everybody, we're going to get started again. Everybody can take their uh, seats and uh, quiet down. We'll get started. Uh, so happy to welcome uh, the Burlington. Excuse me, folks. Give your wrap up here. Thank you. Uh, Burlington Community Justice Center is going to be uh, presenting on the Parallel Justice Program. Where's yours? Hi, folks. How's it going? Hello. Welcome to the Community Justice Center's first community information series on community-based approaches to public safety. My name is Lauren Monaco Eddings. I'm a restorative justice practitioner and a victim services specialist with CP. Hi, my name is Brenda Blazik, and I'm a victim services specialist as well, along with Lauren. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. I look forward to discussing public safety as it relates to Burlington and how our role intersects with other resources in the city. We're super excited to introduce this presentation in what we hope will also be the first of many presentations to the community to support a local and collective effort that responds to the needs of Burlingtonians and Vermonters in regards to public safety and community justice. In our roles here at the CJC, Bridget and I support community members who have experienced crime and harm in a few different ways. Through our parallel justice program, we provide emotional support resource navigation, and systems advocacy to anyone who's experienced harm, regardless of whether or not they go to the police. Bridget is based at the BPD and is an invaluable resource to people who have either made police reports or people who have questions about the criminal justice system. And I'm based at the CJC, where I work to support our community through self-referrals and community referrals, wherein people are looking outside of the criminal justice system. I also work with our youth team and I support teen and young adult victims and survivors when their cases are referred for a restorative process. Our presentation today is community-based and it's evidence-based. Over the last three months, Bridget and I have met with community members, as well as local, local regional and state level stakeholders and representatives working in the fields of public safety in a variety of roles from direct service providers to researchers to our very own state's attorney, Sarah George. Any research reference in the presentation will be available on our community information session page on the website. Thank you all so much for being here and for allowing us into your space. I'm super excited to be here. We also anticipate that there are gonna be some questions and also some contributions from you all. And we kindly request that you save those questions and comments until the end when we're gonna have a Q and A. And just a little overview of what we're going to be looking at today. So we'll be reviewing current climate of crime in Burlington, know what to expect, what, hap what to expect after a crime happens, understanding the root causes of crimes, identify community-based approaches to public safety and harm, become familiar with community resources, and as Lauren said, a Q&A. So because we're community focused, we're going to begin this presentation by offering up a few statements from a diverse group of community members on what public safety means to them. It is not criminal to be poor, to be mentally unwell, or to have an addiction, and yet we treat it like it is. Mutual respect between police and people. Yes, to more community-based social workers. Not jumping to the conclusion that an unusual situation is a dangerous one. Community, community doesn't jump to fear-based reaction. Decriminalization of substance use addiction. 
I think one of the places we could really improve is in providing well-funded alternatives to the police. Huge fractions of our city budget gets put into Burlington police, despite the majority of calls to 911 not demanding an armed response. Mental health response does not need people with guns. Neighbors knowing each other, saying hello to each other, not being afraid of being friendly to each other. Police departments that are supportive of progressive police. <clears throat> um, so as the chief, this is like a perfect segue, I guess, into this presentation. Um, and we are gonna try to pack as much information as possible into the presentation. Like I said, there's gonna be a Q&A afterwards. Um, and as we can see, folks are interested in what, um, in community approaches to community violence, which typically involves a relatively small number of people, but has a lasting impact on the entire community. We also know that violence is learned, which means that the circumstances that increase a person's risk of becoming a victim or a perpetrator can be undone. We will discuss prevention later in the presentation, but first we wanted to take a look about the current climate of crime in Burlington here, which this image shows Reported instances of crime as of mid-November of this year, we recognize that this depiction does not capture unreported crimes, but is a good representation of the general climate of crime. Of, oh, is it small? Sorry. The arrows might be helpful. It's really just a pointing to the fact that these are some of the um, considerable increases we've seen, such as gunfire, larcenies, mental health issues, overdoses, and stolen vehicles. So this is just another depiction. So yeah, this might be an easier graph to read. Um, but this is another depiction of the previous slide that shows percentages of those same categories. Data like this basically informs community-based approaches to public safety and community violence intervention programs. For instance, stolen vehicles has the highest increase you see there at the bottom. What we're noticing is that the recovery rate for stolen vehicles is actually pretty high. So the likelihood that you'll you know, get back your vehicle is high, but it may not be in the same condition as you expect. It may have needles, bodily fluids, stolen items, and personal items from the person who stole the vehicle that are left behind, indicating that possibly the car is being used as shelter or consumption room for um, substances, and then left abandoned when gas runs out. The data of stolen cars mm -hmm. indicates a need for housing, support for substance use, and in a few moments, we'll discuss the root causes of crime and how to use data to do program implementation to address the needs of folks in an effort to deter them from using crime as a solution. We will make all of our slides available to you all so that you can take a look at them a little bit more deeply than you're able to now. And we apologize for that because a lot of this presentation is actually gonna be focused on some of the data that we wanted to share with you all. The red box is just a highlight of, those are the incidents I had mentioned previously to show that those are like maybe of note. I do also want to just share, it is not going to be a distraction to at least me if you want to go up closely to that screen. <laughs> you know, get up now, go and take a look at any point. I will not be offended. Um, so if that feels important to you, you can take a look at it now, but we will also make everything available at the end of the presentation. Sound good? Um, so this is a very simplified flow of what to expect after crime happens when there is a suspect. Um, we recognize that some of you in the room may be very familiar with crime in Burlington and know all too well what happens after crime occurs. We at the Burlington Community Justice Center realize that incidents of crime and harm in our city have had a tremendous impact on individuals, families, neighborhoods, and community at large, and these impacts have been significant. The losses have been emotional, tangible, physical, monetary, and traumatic. And we are sorry that some of you have been victims of assault, larceny, burglary, and stolen vehicles, to name a few. And we hope that you have felt supported by the community in the aftermath. If you have not felt supported, that's also partly why we are here. As Lauren mentioned earlier, we have had a lot of discussions with folks over the last several months, and we sense that the community is feeling disconnected and mistrustful of their neighbors and systems in place to help them. We want you to know that there are resources available, which we will get into at the end. And I apologize, I can't zoom in on this. But so this, like I said, is a simple flow um, for maybe those who are not as familiar or who are confused about what happens about with the process 
um, after a crime occurs, when a criminal investigation leads to a suspect. So after a crime occurs, an arrest is made after a report, an officer can refer directly to the community justice center for crimes such as like a simple assault, retail theft, and larcenies. Once it goes to the community justice center, it will go through the restorative justice process in which the restorative justice process includes somebody who addresses the victim's needs as well as the person who we consider the responsible party similar to a defendant in the criminal justice system. In the more immediacy after a referral and even if there is not an arrest, parallel justice helps with the more immediate needs and safety planning. The officer also can refer to the state's attorney's office for review. The state's attorney's office reviews cases and they can think to prosecute, decline, or send to diversion. If a crime is prosecuted, a case is picked up, the victim advocate at the state attorney's office will address the victim and help with their needs and help them know their victim rights throughout the criminal justice process. If the state's attorney's office declines and doesn't send to diversion, parallel justice is still there. That's our purpose is to fill that gap. And then diversion, which is also a CJC um, based program. Again, it kind of goes back to that victim liaison. And we've included a line here that links crime to no report over to parallel justice. Just to further emphasize that we are a resource to people wherever they are at with the criminal justice system, whether they have questions about how to file a police report, what is the criminal justice system? We have a lot of new Americans in our community. Or folks who say, I'm not really sure I want to file a police report and I'm hurt. We're there for each and every one of those stages just the same. And so we have that line there to really emphasize that, that our door is always open, even if you're not sure if we're an appropriate resource for you. We welcome the call, we'll talk it out, we'll figure out whether what you're sharing with us will stay in house or if we can make a referral to somewhere else. And so next, this is an even simplified version where their crime happens and there is no suspect. Not all investigations lead to an identifiable, an identifiable sub suspect, sorry, which can be frustrating and discouraging, but a real possibility. In those cases, the beginning of the process is similar. So as you see, a crime is reported either online or with an officer. An officer conducts a review of the online report or opens an investigation. But if the investigation turns up no leads, no solvability factors, the case may lead to no arrests. Solvability factors include things like date and time, witnesses, and supporting evidence, which are not clear in all cases, such a large, such such as a larceny from a motor vehicle or vandalism that may have taken place a week ago and is just now being realized. Even when an investigation leads to no suspects, victim services are still available through parallel justice. We offer information and resources as well as other supports, which we can always get into later. So can I interject one thing? Yes. Okay, so I'm with CCTV. Yes. So if anyone has, wants to review this again, you can literally go home from here. And if you have access to YouTube, you can immediately replay it. Wow. We're going to be viral. You should have interrupted us earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going so steady. I didn't want to. The other thing is, in a few days, let's see, this is, so probably by Monday, you'll be able to go online to cctv.org. If you put in today's date, this will pop right up. Because everything recorded today will come right up and you'll be able to watch it again. So you can either watch it on YouTube tonight, or you can wait a few days for the next hundred years. You can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. In the room, CCTV stands for not closed circuit, but Chittenden County. Yeah, it's the public access television in, in Burlington. They used to call it Ch Channel 17. But television access. It's town meeting yeah. television now. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that. I look forward to seeing myself and criticizing what I have to say. Great. So what we have on the screen now, um, the title of this slide is called To Prevent Crime, We Need to Understand and Respond to Its Roots. So there are a few things happening on this slide, including a chart in the middle um, that was compiled by the Prison Policy Initiative um, with using data from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And that chart shows 
people with multiple arrests have serious health needs. So to prevent crime, we really need to understand and respond to its roots. And people who experience multiple arrests, which make up for a quarter of all overrests each year, are people who experience significant health needs that are overwhelmingly unmet before, during, and after criminal justice system contact. Fortunately, in Shenandoah County, we have a growing emphasis on services for people with mental health and substance abuse disabilities who come into contact with the criminal justice system. This is a step in the direction of treating substance abuse, mental illness, poverty, and houselessness as public health issues. And I'm excited to live in a community that has increasingly shown its support for its community members who experience such significant barriers in health equity. Using nationally representative data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the Prison Policy Initiative found that for the at least 4.9 million people that were arrested and jailed in 2017, at least one in four of those individuals were booked into jail more than once during the same year. The graph that's shown on the slide tells us that the people who were booked into jail more than once had a substance use disorder. A third of folks that were booked more than twice had serious psychological distress, and 25% experienced a serious or moderate mental illness, with 27% of those booked more than twice having no health insurance. The report also concluded that people with multiple arrests are disproportionately Black, low income, and unemployed, and that the vast majority of the arrests for that year were for nonviolent offenses, low level offenses such as drug abuse violations and disorderly conduct make up over 80% of arrests with serious violent offenses accounting for less than 5% of arrests in this data sample of 2017. And this is national data. Another way to put all of this is to say that most of the people who are arrested multiple times don't pose a serious public safety risk. And folks are instead being punished for not getting their most basic needs met. I can't help but wonder and consider how at present we are relying on a system of punishment to address an issue of health and life chances. Research, information, relationship building and understanding, however, can direct public and community investments in care. This includes employment assistance, education and vocational training, financial assistance, mental health and substance use treatment, and checking in on your neighbors. These are investments that can help heal the conditions that lead many of our community members to police contact in the first place. So on our next slide here, we have a graph. It's a depiction of a tree um, and there are roots at the bottom of that tree and it shows um, the pair of ACEs. And for those who don't know, um, ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. That's the original assessment. And then in addition to that, the other pair is the adverse community environments. And so that's a tree there. And I'm gonna go into what all of that means now. So I was surprised to find that there is a lack of research on the relationship between adverse childhood experiences, also known, as, also known as ACEs, and adult criminal justice system contact. Considering that exposure to trauma, particularly in childhood, has been associated with a greater risk of substance use disability and mental illness, and that a significant amount of adults who go to jail each year experience these adversities, then the lack of research on this relationship is a critical limitation and a key area for crime and harm prevention. ACEs are determined by an assessment created by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The assessment uses a scoring system that attributes one point for each category of adverse childhood experiences. The questions each cover a different domain of trauma and refer to experiences that occurred prior to the age of 18. Higher scores, like four or above, with the highest score being 10, indicate exp increased exposure to trauma, especially when the score is informed by adverse community environments like racism, poverty, 
poor housing quality and affordability, lack of opportunity, and overall community disruption. You'll see on the tree here that both ACEs and adverse community environments are shown. When taking up a root cause analysis of crime and harm, it is in our best interest to consider a person's experiences and environments leading up to the arrest and not simply the choices that they made which led to the arrest. That adverse community environments represent the roots of the tree, demonstrates how community environments inform family structure, relationships, life chances, and life choices. So because we can't all see the screen, I'll just name some of the few adverse childhood experience traumas that are on that tree, which would include substance abuse, domestic violence, homelessness, mental illness, incarceration, physical and emotional neglect, divorce, maternal depression, emotional and sexual abuse. And for adverse community environments, we have poor housing quality and affordability, discrimination, and poverty, just to name a few. The 2022 research study from the Academic Pediatric Association that I reviewed confirmed that the research on ACEs and criminal justice contact in adulthood was indeed lacking. The study introduced itself as the first of its kind. Using recent national data on adolescent to adult health, the study assesses the relationship between ACEs and formal criminal justice system processing during young and middle adulthood, and found that accumulating ACEs, especially scores of four or more, again, the scale is from one to 10, was significantly associated with various forms of criminal justice contact during young and middle adulthood, including having been arrested, experiencing a greater number of arrests, having been incarcerated in adulthood, having been incarcerated multiple times, and having spent longer periods of time incarcerated. The association between ACEs and formal criminal justice contact extends beyond juvenile years, which there have been studies on, and into young and middle adulthood. <clears throat> My experience working with people who have experienced harm and abuse interpersonal and systemic for the last 10 years, in addition to my personal experience growing up in a household where substance use and abuse was present, has led me to believe that very rarely are people bad actors. And I would be hard pressed to imagine that further studies on the pair of ACEs, so that's adverse childhood experiences and adverse community environments, with criminal justice system contact in adulthood would not conclude similar results as this one. And considering that the criminal justice system is disproportionately composed of adults who have experienced childhood adversity, pushing these individuals and punishing them is not an effective approach to improve lives that have been so characterized by harm. We have about uh, five minutes left. Okay, uh, we five. expected to skip some slides. So this is, as Lauren is saying, you have like risk factors and vulnerabilities. So this is just like a heat map from the Vermont Department of Health that shows these darker areas, which is Burlington, has a higher risk um, when you just consider socioeconomic and poverty. Um, and these kinds of maps would indicate and in, um, inform what kind of programming is needed in certain areas. This is a really important slide to our presentation because this is a slide um, that takes a few data points from the first ever um, survey on victims' experiences with crime in the United States. I was similarly surprised that it was the first survey of its kind. Um, and so this is from the National Alliance for Safety and Justice. And perhaps this may come as a surprise to some, but a significant percentage of victims of both violent and nonviolent crime prefer increased investments in treatment options for those who have caused harm over prisons and jail. And again, this is a really important slide to our presentation um, because we work with victims of crime and harm. And as we strive to be victim informed and victim centered, we're not gonna make any strides forward unless we're, we're listening to victims themselves. And yeah, maybe we can just skip to the next one in the sake of time. Cause we're gonna talk some, um, we're gonna talk shop about a little bit more about what we do at the Burlington Community Justice Center and where we come in here. 
Um, so as I said earlier, so we're victim services specialists. So we kind of lead up to this to understand root causes of harm. As Lauren said, people who have harmed have also been harmed. And so we realize that those can flip flop um, day to day. So we open our doors to anybody who's been affected by crime and harm. And the whole premise of Parallel Justice, it was founded back in 2006 by a woman named Susan Herman, and it was founded on the premise that all victims deserve justice, regardless of whether the crime is reported to the police, and that basically victims can forge their own path towards justice, and we help them do that. And so we help them do that with a victim-centered approach that supports them with emotional support, safety planning, systems advocacy, resource coordination, and some limited financial assistance. And we recognize that a victim may never see the inside of a courtroom and that this may be the only justice that they are able to achieve. And then helping them just to feel supported by the community is like a major um, factor in our program. And then Lauren knows about the conflict assistance program. Yeah, I am excited to talk about this program because it's also a relatively new one for the Community Justice Center. We actually, this is a pilot program. We haven't even been a year. Actually, we just reached our first um, completed year of this program. And so this is another um, criminal legal system alternative for folks who either um, might reach the criminal legal system eventually or for folks who don't want to interact with that system at all. And this is a program that supports uh, Burlington residents navigate conflict. And so our case coordinator works with community members. Um, a lot of the work that she does is around uh, neighborhood disputes, conflict coaching, a lot of one-on-one -on -one support, as well as restorative dialogues between both people that are involved in that conflict. And these are all services that happen at the community level that can help de-escalate existing conflicts and also prevent interpersonal conflicts from forming. All of our services are sliding scale or they're free and we never turn any anyone away for a lack of funds. Okay. Um, so we're just going to skip ahead a little bit. The chief we, did a great job of talking about cahoots in the CSL. So there will be time for questions. It will be time for questions. Yes. Yeah. I think and so. We, well, I think we might need to um, do questions at the end of the, okay. of this evening as well. And just mindful we have some other folks coming up to present. Sure, sure. And if we don't get to any questions today, also, you know, folks can email us and also give us a call and we're happy to talk more. Yeah. Um, so here we just have different, so we talked about, you know, like community-based approaches to public mm -hmm. safety. And sometimes it feels like it's something we're always working towards, but actually we have some already in place here. So things like old North End mutual aid, they just received a grant at Pathways for a Peer Workforce Development Program. Turning Point is a peer-supported recovery center. Howard Center has a street outreach, which builds relationships with folks. We have faith-based organizations, such as The New Place, which has a low-barrier facility for people facing houselessness. The Family Room also has parenting and child care programs that do early intervention. Um, something I really have liked is that the Office of Neighborhood Safety, they have meetings such as this with they have various stakeholders that work towards building safety plans for the neighborhood. Um, and that could be things like block parties and gardening projects and things like that can really bring the community together. And that's based out of New York City. So the secret to a healthy community, it might lie in our relationships to one another. Genuine partnerships between community members policymakers, and community-based organizations, particularly those led by formerly justice system-involved people, advances community trust, public safety, and health and racial equity. Thank you all so much. And I do want to just give a quick shout out to some of the folks who were a big part of how we all got here and some of the information on these slides. And so that involves the Parallel Justice Commission, Karen Vestein of UVM Health Network, City Councilor Ali Dieng, Aline Mukiza of the Howard Center, State's Attorney Sarah George, Tammy Buda of the Howard Center Street Outreach Team, Dr. Kathy Fox of UVM, Deb Hinchy of UVM, Dee Barlick, Dee Barbick, the Vermont Violence Prevention Task Force, Talitha Consults, Malo Grant, a police commissioner, and to our community members and to you all. So thank you so much. All right, thank you very much uh, to Lauren and Bridget from the Burlington Community Justice Center Parallel Justice Program. It was a great presentation. Thanks. Should we wait for questions afterwards? Uh, if folks that... do have questions, we have, uh, we're set to wrap, um, I think probably closer to 18 or so if you're available to stay. Yeah. Uh, if not, maybe you could share your information afterwards uh, for questions over email or phone. We'll hang out.
All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, next up, we're happy to welcome the Burlington Electric Department. Uh, talking about building electrical policy. So Darren Springer and Jen Green. <laughs> I'm going to take this table right here. Actually, will work if uh, that works well for you. Yeah. Thank you. Got two mics for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Actually, it's better for me if you're over here. Oh, sure. Okay. No problem. Dogs in charge. Because <laughs> otherwise, I have to go right through people. So. Yeah. Thanks, Dale. We appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you everyone. We really appreciate um, being here. Um, my name is Jennifer Green and I'm the Director of Sustainability and Workforce Development at Burlington Electric. And I'm so pleased to be here with General Manager um, Darren Springer. Our plan tonight over our next 20 minutes is um, to tell you a little bit about some of the commercial electrification policies, building policies that we're considering and that the city council has requested and then get some feedback from, from you all. Before that, though, I do want to just set the table so we all understand sort of some of the basic assumptions that are coming into the building electrification policies that we're, we'd like to potentially recommend. And that's um, BED's history and the fact that we're the first um, utility for a city in the country to source 100% of our electricity from renewables, as you may all be aware. So that, of course, is biomass, wind, solar, and hydro. And this sort of a big achievement was um, accomplished in 2014, at which point we decided we're going to take it to the next level, which is to transition away from fossil fuels in the ground transportation and built environment by 2030, essentially becoming a net zero energy city by 2030. So to help us in that effort, we're fortunate that we have uh, funding that we distribute by way of incentives and rebates for heat pumps and really anything that you want to use electricity for from lawnmowers, Darren's a big uh, a lawnmower aficionado, uh, electric vehicles, of course, e-bikes, et cetera. So we have sort of that bucket of support. We also have technical support that we offer um, through our energy efficiency team. Um, together, these things are helping us on our path. But we know that we can't do it with just what we think of as sort of carrots, that we need to be thinking about policy as well. And hence, the city council coming to us and asking for um, some building recommendations or policy recommendations, particularly around electrification of uh, large commercial spaces and our city buildings. So I'm really happy now to turn it over to Darren to give you the, the background on what brought us to this point and then where we are and what we'll be doing um, City Council on Monday. Thanks, Jen. Uh, great to be with everybody. Um, I'm Darren Springer, General Manager with Burlington Electric. Uh, this is the last NPA meeting on our NPA Roadshow on this topic. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're, we're glad to be with you. Um, we are scheduled to present on this topic uh, Monday evening at City Council. For any frequent City Council uh, meeting watchers, you'll see us uh, there. And um, we really, this kind of dates back to the town meeting day 2021 uh, vote. Uh, if folks recall, we had a vote on whether the city should seek a charter change uh, related to regulating greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. And uh, we got about 65% of the community said yes. Um, there was also an advisory ballot question that spoke to trying to provide some of the benefits from this approach uh, in an equitable manner um, to the community. No worries. <laughs> um, and uh, and so after those votes, um, we had consideration in the legislature this past session uh, of the charter change. It was approved. The governor signed it. Uh, that happened around April. And then in May, uh, the city council resolution that Jen referenced uh, was adopted that asked us and the Department of Permitting and Inspections to look into policy recommendations for building emission reduction. And we are focused primarily on new construction, on large existing buildings, which we're defining as about 50,000 square feet or larger, really only about 80 buildings in the city that meet that threshold, and then uh, city buildings as well. So what we're not doing is we're not proposing anything related to residential housing, whether single family or multifamily or rental or condo. Uh, we're not proposing anything related to small businesses. This is really for new construction, city buildings, and the largest existing commercial buildings in the city. And we issued an interim report. It's up on our website on July 18th. Uh, we've had a number of stakeholder meetings. Uh, we've done webinars with different folks in the energy efficiency and the design communities, taking a lot of feedback. 
And um, we have a final report that we'll present on uh, Monday evening. And basically what we're proposing is, is a couple things. Uh, first would be for new construction, we're proposing that assuming um, it would be approved by the council and assuming that voters would subsequently approve it town meeting day 2023, because we'd have to have another vote on this to be able to enact it, uh, that all new construction starting in 2024 would be renewable in terms of the heating and the thermal systems in the building. So heating, water heating, cooking, appliances, um, all of those types of uses would be renewable. Uh, we currently have a requirement that was passed last year that says that the heating system has to be renewable. So this would expand that to cover more uses within the building. And we also would be able to say that if you're not able to use a renewable heating system or a renewable fuel, that there could be a carbon impact fee as an alternative compliance that would apply at the time of permit for new construction. Um, in addition, for the large existing buildings and the city buildings, it would be a similar requirement move towards a renewable heating system or renewable water heating system if you're pulling a permit for an existing building, large existing building or city building, um, or in the case of the large existing buildings, you could also pay the, the alternative compliance fee. Um, we have a couple ideas within the report for how to utilize proceeds from the from the fee. Um, one of them would be to help the city with its own efforts to electrify its fleet and its vehicles and its lawn equipment, uh, which can save money for all taxpayers and help with the city in terms of leading by example. Um, a second uh, uh, effort would be to create a new city fund to support uh, clean heating installations for low-income residents and low-income renters, which would be consistent with the advisory question seven uh, from town meeting day 2021. And then the third option for existing buildings would be if somebody is paying in uh, that they would have an option to get some of the revenue back if they propose a plan to reduce emissions at their building or at their facility or within their own fleet. Uh, so give folks an option if they have to pay the fee to be able to use a portion of it to help with the city's goals uh, and with its own uh, emissions reductions. So that's uh, kind of a very hopefully quick enough summary uh, of what we're looking at. It's a uh, it's a relatively uh, long memo for us, about eight pages. It's got some analysis in there and we'll we'll go into more detail, um, I think at the city council meeting, but uh, really we're hoping to hear is um, if folks have feedback for us, have ideas, have questions, uh, we're happy to have those um, as well as just sometimes when, when Jen and I visit the MPAs, uh, people have questions more generally about Burlington Electric, about our work, about uh, different technologies. So we're happy to, to talk about anything that's of interest um, and I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks for having us. Hi, yeah, my name's Megan. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, New York. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Megan Epler Wood, and um, I read the previous projections that were done by the outside firm from Cambridge, mm -hmm. and they emphasized um, rental housing as being one of the most important ways of uh, reducing our towards net zero. And I noticed that's no, not, and I talked to someone about that and it seemed very unfeasible to work with the, that part of the problem in a rapid manner. So I'm wondering how you came up with these new uh, assumptions that you wouldn't have to work with rental housing. We definitely believe rental housing has, uh, you know, has policy associated with it, but, um, this set of recommendations isn't focused on rental housing. What we do have is, was passed um, in 2021, is rental weatherization standards um, that are affecting rental housing, existing rental housing. We basically start with the largest energy use buildings and they're going through <clears throat> compliance now. And we look at having a phase in over a period of the next few years as we get through each cohort. There's a challenge with weatherization. There's not enough workforce. Um, there's a backlog in terms of, um, you know, if you're trying to participate in one of the programs, uh, the utility programs or the state programs. So that policy tries to really set up a, a kind of staged process with the rental buildings to get the biggest energy users first and then kind of move through and uh, get to a point where all buildings have some uh, basic weatherization and we're not losing fuel and warmth uh, out the window or out the, you know, unsealed uh you know property just a clarification so if you're phasing which i i think is feasible and makes sense mm -hmm. but doesn't that lower your chance of reaching a real net zero result by your target date 
there's no question net zero 2030 is very, very ambitious goal. It's basically the most ambitious climate goal anywhere in the country. I think Ann Arbor, Michigan has now adopted a similar goal. So we're not alone, but uh, we were first. And uh, what I think of as net zero 2030 is really, it's a guiding kind of North Star is that if you have that ambitious of a goal, it does require that you concentrate your minds on all the different tools in the toolbox, as Jen was mentioning, the incentives, the policies. So um, there is a time frame for rental weatherization that is consistent. Uh, it's actually it, it, the phase in ends before 2030. Um, but there is definitely uh, a challenge in getting to the goal that we have in the time frame that we have. Uh, even if you got halfway there, we'd be doing a lot more than a lot of communities around the country. And uh, I think we're striving to really uh, do as much as possible to kind of not only reduce emissions in Burlington, but hopefully uh, be able to model policies that can be used in other communities as well. So I, I love your presentation. I love what you do. Uh, fantastic job. But one opportunity that I like to that I see is I, I live next to Champlain College. They have parking lots, parking lots are all over the place. they are water issues with parking lots. There are uh, heat issues with parking lots. Why doesn't Burlington Electric develop a plan to put solar panels on parking lots and deal with the water, deal with the electricity? Uh, you know, it seems like that would be a real opportunity. <clears throat> yeah, um, we love solar panels on parking lots. We're, we're for it. Um, you know, we, we have a, a state program that uh, is called the net metering program, where if, if somebody wanted to put up a structure uh, and be able to use their parking lot, they can participate in that program where they can use some of the energy on site. They can send some of it back to the grid uh, and we pay them for the energy that they're sending back. So that's that's one avenue to do that. Um, and then we also uh, look at power purchase agreements. Um, so there's a great example, I think, of, of what you're talking about over at the Echo uh, Museum. Uh, I was down there for the opening of that. That's uh, Encore Renewables, a local Burlington renewable company. And they've got, uh, I think it's 150 kilowatts of solar, uh, parking canopy cover, a lot of co-benefits associated with that. Uh, and we're supporting that project and are participating in that. So um, yeah, I agree with you. We're, we're on board and uh, we we definitely like to find opportunities for solar in the city uh, because we don't have big open fields like there are in rural Vermont where you might be able to place a larger project. So we're really looking at exactly this. It's, it's rooftop, it's parking structures. The one challenge that I've heard from some of the renewable developers is that the parking structure tends to be more expensive. Um, so it may not always pencil for folks who are looking at the project, but I think it has a lot of benefits and we're very supportive of it. We have a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> we need to share your name as well. Yeah, Greg Eplerwood again. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Greg. <laughs> um, BED City. Um, and, you know, you're looking at uh, this through electrical uh, lens. And But there has been efforts to build out district energy. Mm -hmm. And for those people who don't know district energy, that's using waste heat at the at the plant, at our, at our power plant. <clears throat> And distributing it through the city over major lines and trunk lines, and then and then to other smaller uh, buildings. And I think there's at least one, maybe two anchor tenants who have said that they would be willing to involve this. Would you be uh, supporting district energy, or do you view that as too difficult or adversarial uh, to reach that 2030 goal? No. So McNeil is the woodchip plant is our plant. Uh, we run the plant. And we've been working on district energy uh, since I became general manager in 2018. We've been working intensively on district energy. Um, no, we're 100% we're supportive of district energy. Uh, we've, we've gone through uh, three phases of feasibility work uh, over the last several years with our partners, Evergreen Energy, that we have from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And they run a similar system with a wood chip plant in Minnesota, and they develop these around the country. So we're working with them, with Vermont Gas, with UVM, with UVM Medical Center, with the Intervale Center, uh, and the city. And uh, it's been a, it's a long process overall, right? Because the plant was built in the early 80s and was permitted for this purpose in part with district energy. So this most recent iteration is four years old, but the, the you know, the effort is 40 years old. Um, that said, we have a presentation also on Monday evening uh, to give the council uh, a substantive update on district energy, myself and uh, Neil Lunderville, who's the CEO of Vermont Gas. 
and Michael Ahern, who's a vice president at Evergreen Energy. Uh, so I'd invite you to tune in. We've got some, some uh, uh, exciting announcements coming on district energy. We continue to, to move the project forward. Uh, the challenge is, uh, at the moment, is financial. Um, it's, it would be a debt finance project, and interest rates are higher, uh, so that's one challenge. Um, electric market prices are a lot higher, so uh, that also creates some challenges for us at McNeil. And then the construction pricing has gone up over the course of the last several years. Um, on the other hand, we were able, with Senator Leahy's help, to secure some federal funding, uh, a little over $5 million that could go towards supporting the project. So we're working hard on the financials of that and uh, hopeful that we'll be able to move it forward. Any other questions? Uh, any folks online? I'm good. All right. Go ahead, Alan. Alan Matson, I just got wondering as I was listening to this, how does the McNeil plant actually figure in? Because it's not a net zero electric producing plant, is it? So this gets into a great question, which is uh, the carbon accounting of biomass, right? And um, there are a lot of different opinions on it. Um, what we do at McNeil, I would argue, is different than what some people think of with biomass if you were clear cutting and not restoring uh, the woods. Um, what we have is four foresters who work with us. We harvest within roughly a 60 to 70 mile radius of the plant. And we're typically able to work with lands that are managed lands. So they're, they're working lands, they're harvesting, and they're regrowing and sequestering carbon. Uh, we've had some independent analysis that suggests that in the areas of New York and Vermont where we harvest, that's actually adding carbon, net carbon, uh, over the last uh, several decades. So EPA and, and the state and others who would look at it would really say that you look at it based on that land use component. Because uh, when you're burning wood, there's carbon emitted. Uh, if you're regrowing uh, the trees, you're sequestering carbon, and there's the potential to have that balance out. Uh, particularly for an older plant like McNeil that's been running for a long enough period of time where you've had regrowth at some of the original sites that you've harvested. Um, so we actually looked at this as well with um, uh, BEIC, which is uh, the organization that runs Efficiency Vermont. And we asked them earlier this year to say, look at not just McNeil from a wood energy standpoint, but look at all of the upstream uh, emissions that are associated with procuring wood chips, whether that's running a train or a truck to the plant, uh, diesel loader, whatever it might be, and count all of that, and then compare McNeil to natural gas plants on the electric grid that are running typically at the same time that McNeil's running, and don't even count any of their upstream emissions, the methane leaks from the pipelines, the different uh, you know, extraction-related emissions. So kind of give us the worst case for McNeil and the best case for the gas plant. And they came back and said McNeil's still 85% better on emissions than the natural gas that's the dominant fuel in New England. So wow. we're, we're, fairly, we're fairly proud of the work that's going on at McNeil. Uh, it's a very complicated area of carbon accounting, so I appreciate you asking about it. Uh, we think that there's a good case for the McNeil plant, um, but biomass is different in all different regions of the country. All right. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you all. Thank Appreciate you. It. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Don't I just see you one? Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, we have friends of the frame. Oh. Zach, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you want to sit here as well since this is the good spot? Uh, let's see. Might be might be difficult to set up though. Are you still interested in the Salad Waste District being the alternate? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we should talk because I think my term should be done soon. Sure. Okay. All right. The folks on I will maybe take two minutes and get set up, and then we'll get rolling. Uh, I will send it to you. Give me one. I think he joins the Zoom, might be faster. Uh, either one, really. Um, if you just do S, I actually joined. You can join them. I think I've got it on my calendar. Um, okay. All right. No, if you go to um, Burlington, I actually don't know. I guessed 15 minutes. Um, uh, but uh, you know, you're on that. Yes, right there. Okay, scroll down. Okay, I'm sure we're still uh, broadcasting, but yeah, I think it's. Uh... <laughs> so sip our water here. Uh, yeah, I think it sounds good. I think we're we're generally on on track agenda wise too. So, yeah. Thank you.
Uh, super interesting about uh, McNeil. That's wild. That's 85% better for carbon emissions compared to the best case scenario for gas. I'm going to look at that analysis now. All right. All right. Here we go. All right. Thanks so much, Zach. Uh, floor is yours. All right. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me to come and uh, speak to you all tonight. I uh, My name is Zach Campbell, and I'm from an organization called Friends of the Frame. Uh, the, the Moran Frame has been in the news recently with uh, the ribbon cutting that happened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'd like to just kind of share a little bit about what we've, uh, what I've been doing, uh, working with the city and uh, kind of what things are going on now and what things are coming in the future. Um, so again, I, uh, I'm from an organization called Friends of the Frame. Uh, it's an independent uh, organization outside of the city of Burlington that uh, was organized to really kind of um, facilitate the sustained use of the frame as this uh, ever-evolving public space that um, brings in high quality, inclusive public programming and uh, helps support ongoing stewardship of the space as well as uh, procures funding for various things um, at the frame in partnership with, uh, with the various city agencies such as BPRW or BCA. And uh, if you haven't seen any photos of it, um, Phase one is now complete. I don't know if, if people have been down to the waterfront lately. It's starting to get a bit cold and windy, but here are some photos from a few weeks ago. Uh, it's looking really nice down there. Um, and depending on kind of the weather, the time of day, you can see that the experience and uh, the way that it looks kind of changes throughout the day in a really, um, really nice way. Um, also, on, on my end of things, with Friends of the Frame, we've been, uh, we, we've had a few kind of things that we're trying to push ahead uh, here uh, leading up to the end of the year. One of the things that we did was we launched uh, a website for the frame. It's theframebtv.org. That's uh, going to kind of be the, the main place to go to find out about upcoming events or installations or just general goings on. At the frame, uh, there's also places where um, people can read about the history of the of uh, the Moran plant and how it got to be uh, the Moran frame. Uh, there's places to donate, and and uh, this website will kind of grow and evolve over time. And um, there's some plans to uh, bring some really interesting engagement tools so that people can um, kind of provide feedback or share ideas almost in real time um, and kind of build upon the legacy of the of the Moran frame as this place that's always kind of inspired these big crazy ideas and people get excited about them. And uh, we definitely are interested in kind of keeping that energy going and, and figuring out how to um, empower it in new ways. Another thing we worked on that you would see if you uh, go down to the space is we have these, uh, right now there are two of these hanging uh, bench swings that kind of pick up on the language of the uh, the three-step form of the space. And uh, we work with Generator to design and fabricate those swings. The, uh, the goal is to get more of them and hopefully find um, people who might be interested in, in sponsoring additional swings. Um, but I'm actually gonna talk about swings again in a second, uh, because one of the other things that is going on right now also involves some more swings. Uh, the ribbon cutting ceremony was a few weeks ago, as I mentioned, and then actually coming up uh, on New Year's Eve as part of Highlight, there's going to be a uh, projection installation at the frame where we're actually, we actually purchased uh, a stretchable screen that fits within one of the openings in the steel. You got shown there? Yeah, that's a that's a uh, mock up of it, but it it will look like that, and there will be views kind of um, from far away in Waterfront Park as well. Uh, it's going to be a very kind of cool, immersive thing with sound and uh, and projection. So looking forward to that. The other uh, really big thing that's going on right now uh, that I'll spend some time talking about is um, Friends of the Frames pursuing a uh, 
kind of unique grant opportunity uh, with the state of Vermont that also includes a crowdfunding campaign and the grant is structured as um, it starts with a crowdfunding campaign and then the deal is if if your campaign is able to hit its target uh, the the project gets a two to one matching grant from the state of Vermont through the better pay, better places program and so really the reason that we're going after this is because uh, phase one of the RAN frame vision was really kind of heavily focused on stabilizing the site and the structure, which were contaminated, and um, there were some structural issues that needed to be addressed, although the, the building superstructure was in pretty good shape overall, but there were hazardous, hazardous materials, asbestos, lead paint, all kinds of nasty stuff that are very expensive to deal with, and you don't really see anything new at the end of the day. I mean, the, the steel was painted this awesome red color. That's that's really kind of cool to check out. But um, in terms of the things that uh, you can bring down to a space, uh, especially a public space that really kind of uh, make it inviting and comfortable and easy to use, there weren't there wasn't really room in the budget for <laughs> as many of those things. And so uh, us as, as friends of the frame, we really want to start bringing uh, people to the space to enjoy performances or events or um, you know any number of pop-up markets or art installations. And in order to do that, we we need to kind of add this um, this very uh, modest but crucial uh, set of things that are going to enable this to happen starting next year. But uh, as I said, there wasn't money for it in the first phase, so we're we're looking for some help to kind of do the uh, crowdfunding portion of um, of raising these dollars, and then hopefully get a, a two to one matching grant from the state to really kind of uh, get us the rest of the way there. Uh, as I mentioned, we're we're looking at a mix of things, but really it's three key areas that we're that we're interested in. So one would be free public amenities, uh, art and activation is the other one, and then crucial support for events and performances. And really, you know, this this is the mix that we think, you know, it, it adds some of these uh, kind of compelling elements that people get a little bit more excited about perhaps than others, but also has um, really kind of utilitarian things that come up in every every discussion about somebody who might want to have an event at the frame, like, do you have storage on site that's lockable and secure? And so figuring out how do you kind of balance uh, the needs with, uh, with the things that are more exciting. Um, but I think we have a pretty good mix here. And really what this is going to do um, is, is bring a, in, enable a kind of robust set of uh, activations, events, and installations in 2023 that are actually going to serve as kind of a, a ground test for some ideas about longer term use of this space and what can it be and what should it be and what works well and what's missing. And we're really going to kind of pair this with um, soliciting feedback from the public, and that's going to drive future decision making. Um, and so here's kind of where we are with our crowdfunding, the crowdfunding portion of our campaign. We have two weeks left and we've got uh, $11,000 to go. Uh, we've been uh, kind of, we launched a couple of weeks ago. It's a, it's a fairly short campaign, um, but we do get a two to one grant if the goal is reached. And we have lots of gifts and raffle items uh, for, for people that make contributions. So that's all I have for you today, but I'm happy to kind of answer some questions and yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I know crowdfunding, um, you know, that is very difficult. Greg Epler, what's up? Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Greg. In case you didn't hear it first two times. Um, uh, you know, to do a crowdfunding, you really need some incentives. And where those three areas and those little bullet points under those three areas, that's the crowdfunding uh, what you're pitching to that, that the, sc on... the scope correct oh, okay all right uh, the incentive you mean uh, um as like kind of thank you incentives for for donations yeah exactly yeah we do have a we do have a mix of those um we, you know it's a kind of a blend of um the frame swag <laughs> and uh and a few um 
kind of things that were donated from local. So how do we find it if we go online to? Uh... Yeah, so um, I can, I'm happy to share the uh, the website address, but it's the framebtv.org. There's a donate button right on the homepage. If you click that, it, the crowdfunding link is right at the top. So if I, if I may, I have two, two things. One, <laughs> one is a, a fundraising idea. Uh, the state of Vermont doesn't have a film and video uh, office anymore, but if you get the frame on the list of producers, film, motion picture producers, it would, I think, make a pretty good uh, location. They're looking for unique location spots and you get money if it's used for that. You know, think James Bond and the Casino Royale. Okay. Uh, and the second is, is that I, this is pie in the sky, but uh, when the, um, when the big hole was, they were going to put buildings up, up, you know, and the, I was I, I plotted out and I even made some contacts about putting a ski lift from the frame <laughs> up to the top of the, one of those buildings up there. And uh, it works. I mean, I was looking at it. It's a nice shot. And because people want to get high, that building is there. So people want to get at the top and look out. I mean, that's the one advantage of that building. Right. There's so CBD up there so they can get high. CBD or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Had a much more boring question. That was pretty fun. Yeah. Um, I I don't understand the relationship of your organization to the city. And I did you explain that? Or and, and how are you, how is your organization empowered at this time to manage what's going on at the building? Sure. Uh, I I very quickly kind of um, talked about it, but I'll, I'll I'll go a little bit more in depth now. So Friends of the Frame, it's independent from the city. It's not, I don't work for the city. Right now I'm in a pilot agreement with the city. Essentially, um, if you kind of think about similar organizations, um, the High Line in New York is, is kind of an example where it's operated and managed by Friends of the High Line in partnership with the New York City Parks Department. The city of New York owns that space and the structure, but they work with friends of the High Line because they they're able to bring a lot of um, energy and other uh, resources to that space, and they have an agreement that outlines roles and responsibilities. That's kind of what we're work I'm working toward with the city long term. This pilot phase is um, really next year's kind of you know there's a lot of testing going on both on the agreement side of things between Friends of the Frame and the, and the city of Burlington, um, and also on actually what's happening on the site. So in terms of where we are now, that's a written agreement. And um, you know we're kind of figuring out those exact mix of roles and responsibilities going forward. Um, but it's it's gone quite well so far, and I'm excited to. With what department? Uh, so it's a it's a mix. I mean, uh, started kind of working more with uh, CEDO, especially as the building was under construction. It was in more CEDO support, but um, it's in Waterfront Park, and it's going to be operated in large part by uh, the Parks Department. So, uh, and then BCA obviously is a yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, okay. One more question. <laughs> Very quick. So if one of us or more have what we consider a fabulous or insane or both idea, do we get in touch with you or with the city? You can get in touch with me. Got it. <laughs> All right. Good things. Too bad Ringling Brothers no longer. <laughs> <laughs> Good things happening. Um, I I, yeah. that okay? Yes, yes. Uh, so in addition to being a victim services specialist for Dyslexic, I also do the noise ticket programs, so I do a sort of noise program, and a lot of the tickets are received by UVM college age students who are looking for band venues, and they are looking uh -huh. at places, but they are students trying to make money, and a lot of places take their proceeds, so the frame might be a great place for UVM students and working with um, the community to offer their spaces and reduce noise for yeah, we should reduce noise. It sounds like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, we have um, thank you so much, Zach. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, our last agenda item of the evening do we have uh, Robert with uh, Public Works here tonight? Uh, is possibly Patrick. online? Yeah, Jeff Patrick. Oh, yeah. Oh, Jeff, yeah. All right, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, I'll uh, turn it over to you for uh, for uh, parking services. Yeah, let me uh, share my screen here. All right, you guys are seeing this. Oops. Uh, yes, you're up. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much for having me.
Um, I'm here tonight to, I will go quick, about eight slides. I re appreciate we're running a little late, so I'll, I'll go quickly, um, but please interrupt me if you have a question. So my name is Jeff Paget. I'm the Division Director for Parking and Traffic. Um, I'm actually in charge of parking services, parking facilities, and traffic. So parking services are the folks that write tickets and sell permits for the garages. Parking facilities is the group that actually takes care of the build the facilities, the actual garage facilities and our lots. And traffic are the folks that take care of the signals and the signs and the lines and the crossing guards. Um, and these are th three completely independent groups and they are all self-funded. So we don't actually operate on any tax dollars. So that's an important thing for people to understand is that all of our traffic, like our traffic signals, the lights that you would expect would be a reasonable thing that tax dollars would pay for, those are actually paid for by in whole by the revenues from parking meters. So a quarter at a time. So anyway, what I wanna talk about tonight real quickly is parking services, because we have some amazing things happening in this group. Um, over the past two years, we've had a major shift in how we address parking. And we now have a new motto that we go by and it's called, uh, safety and equity. So we've started looking at everything we do from a safety and equity lens, which means that if you're getting a parking ticket, it's probably because there's an ordinance that says that you're violating some sort of safety issue or an equity issue. So that would be if you're parked in front of a fire hydrant, that's a safety issue. If you're parked in the handicap spot and you're not, uh, you don't have the proper credentials, that's an equity issue. So we're trying to reframe how we approach ticket writing. And we used to write citations for violations. Now we write tickets for safety and equity. <laughs> so important reframing, right? <laughs> so our goal is to minimize tickets and minimize towing. And anybody who gets towed tomorrow is gonna not believe me, <laughs> but we are sincerely making lots of changes that are strategically aimed at minimizing tickets and minimizing towing because we see that as an equity issue. When someone's car is removed from their, you know, we're, we're taking someone's asset and they are using that to get to their job or do whatever they're doing in their life. And we don't wanna interrupt that. So in order to get to all this safety and equity and minimize everything, we have made some major changes. We moved the staff from BPD, the, what formerly was parking enforcement, and we moved that staff into DPW. And we also concurrently, we took the gates off of the garages. I don't know if anybody's parked downtown recently, but we took the gates off. And when we took the gates off, that radically changed how we managed the garages, which meant that the staff that was at the garage was no longer needed for to be in the garage all the time. So we moved staff into parking services. And then we, we aggressively retrained staff on different job duties, customer service specifically. And what this has done is it's resulted in an increased ability to provide coverage. And we'll, I'll talk about that on the uh, next slide. And what, what I mean by coverage is we have staff, we have more staff in the field over more parts of the day so that we can respond more quickly to the needs of the community. So some of the things we've done, what we're trying to do is build a one-stop shop for parking. So if you have a question about parking, you go to DPW or, you know, Burlington uh, VT.gov slash parking. And there's a website there that will have everything you need on it. We are a one-stop shop. You go down to 645 Pine Street, go to the window. You can get any parking question you have answered. We're not quite there yet, but we're heading that way very quickly. Um, one of the equity issues we did last year was we reformed SCOF. SCOF is when you get your car towed because you don't pay your tickets. So the threshold for SCOF used to be $75, which meant if you got one ticket, the next ticket you got, you were getting car towed, which is pretty much a one and done, which is just not fair. So we raised the threshold to $275. And concurrent with that changing in the threshold, we launched the Fines for Food program. And I think I saw Councillor Paul on this call. She was instrumental in guiding us towards this program, which for the month of December, it just started on Friday. If you pay off your overdue parking tickets, this is only for overdue tickets. 
Um, if you pay off your overdue parking ticket, we give half of the money we raise to feeding Chittenden. Last year, we gave them a check for $40,000. Wow. Yeah, it's huge. And we're, <laughs> we're looking to at least increase that by 50% this year. We're hoping. We just sent out 7,000, no, 8,000 direct mail letters to everyone who owes money. So hopefully they pay. So anyway, so I'm going to keep cranking because I'm, I'm sure I know we're running on time. So um, uh, free holiday parking, Fridays and Saturdays through the end of the year. There's two hours free anywhere you park. If you use Park Mobile, you get two hours free. That's in the city parking lots, city parking garages, in the meters, and even in parks owned lots. So we actually have a relationship with parks because they own a number of parking facilities and we're expanding our services to support parks because they, ironically, they're very good at parks, but it, they admit themselves not so good at parking. So we're helping them there. Um, we're working, we work very closely with VHS with you know, their challenge of moving all their students into the Macy's. Um, you know, we have a parking garage right there. So we've worked with them to get them discounted parking. We've worked with them to create a rooftop garden um, on top of the garage, um, which has lots of legal challenges around it, but we've got through that. Um, we're working with car share, um, actually putting elect, uh, chargers in the marketplace garage to support the car share uh, electric vehicles. Um, we have created fully digital resident only permits. I know Ward 6 has a, quite a bit of resident parking in it. You probably used to have those green, silvery, gigantic gross stickers. You don't need those anymore. Those are gone. If you still have one in your car, you should have gotten a new ticket or a new uh, permit for this year and been told that it's digital. If you don't know that, please stop by 645 Pine Street or, or, or call them 540-2380 uh, um, and talk to someone about making sure that your credentials are correct because you do not need that ugly green sticker anymore. Um, we created a contractor parking for resident only. This was a big problem for contractors. They're so mad. They'd come, they'd work on somebody's house and they'd get a ticket. So we created a program for them so that they could actually buy a permit for a, a month, a, a month, a quarter, a year. And then they can park anywhere they want in resident only when they're working on someone's house. Um, we create a whoops program. So if you get a ticket because you parked in resident only, or you get a ticket because you parked uh, you stay overstayed a meter, you can actually once a year, you can say, you know what, can you whoops this for me? And we will write that ticket off. We'll write it down. Um, uh, uh, we, yeah, you have it, don't you? You have resident parking in front. Yeah, we don't. But. Yeah. So we've removed the transaction fee for online payments. Used to be if you got a ticket and you wanted to pay online, we charge, I think it was an extra 275. Well, that's just paying on top of paying. So we took that away. So you go online, you just pay your ticket. Um, so I've already talked about the increase in staffing um, and we are really focused on customer service. Uh, we have parking service agents. We don't have parking enforcement officers anymore. We're trying to reframe this whole concept of, of how people, how we approach people and hopefully how people approach us because we are people and we're, we're trying to do our job and make the community safe and, and enforce the, the rules that we've decided as a community that we want to live by, which is, you know, in our case, ordinance. Um, so anyway, preview, we're headed towards 24, 365 service. So our vision is as soon as we can get people hired, you won't have to call the police two o'clock in the morning. You can call us and we'll take care of you. Um, we're ongoing uh, upgrades to our digital permitting system and web sales. We just launched a whole new platform uh, last week. Um, so. There's more improvements coming there. We're actually actively talking with some members of the Public Works Commission about changing ordinances to minimize towing. There are some fairly rigid and strict penalties in ordinance. And my challenge is I don't have the authority to do anything but what's in ordinance. So we have to change the ordinance. Um, we're working, hopefully start up in January, February timeframe, a visioning project for the marketplace garage. That garage is 50 years old. It's actively falling apart. Um, we're actually putting half a million dollars into it right now over the winter um, to patch it up for the next three to five years to allow us to contemplate the next 
the next version of what happens at the marketplace garage site. And then we just rebranded the garage that's behind the Hilton and Hotel Vermont. We branded that as the downtown garage because nobody knows what it's called. Uh, <laughs> it was called the Lakeview and College Street Garage Complex, which nobody can remember. So we rebranded <laughs> downtown garage. That's it. So anyway, so I blasted through there, like I said. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, cycle back through any slides. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Mark Howe, and uh, I have a question concerning uh, the transition from parking enforcement with the police department and uh, to uh, parking services with DPW. Um, and you may already have answered this in the 24 seven thing that you said, but that went by pretty quick. Yep, if yep. somebody's parking across my driveway yes. and it's a Saturday night, yes. I don't think I can get anybody at DPW. Not not, not right I, now. Right now, right now you need to call the police. Calling dispatch is the best thing to do right now. I can't seem to find my uh my stop sharing button. Uh oh, there it is. Um right now, because we don't have our staffing up, we only have about 10 people, we need 14. As soon as we get to 14, we're going 24 7, 365. So, the best thing to do for the foreseeable future is call the police, and dispatch will either deal with themselves or they will call us because okay. we coordinate with them so they know if we're available. And we're available. So, we have five people working during the day and five people working at night. So, working until I think they're going until 11 o'clock at night. So, we have pretty solid coverage all day. A year ago, we had three people, get five positions, four filled one left at three people <laughs> and so for all day from eight in the morning to 11 o'clock at night now we got five people in the day and five people in the night thank you yeah other questions sir? yeah i was just wondering how you manage the the garages and for safety and also how do you keep it from being a, a place for homeless too yeah we we work really hard on this um we've made a a number of upgrades in the garages. Um, we've put in, a, we've replaced a bunch of cameras. They were broken cameras. We've, we've replaced them. We put in camera monitors now. So if you go, when you go in the garage, if you look at the booth, you'll see there's a, a TV screen and you can see it looks like a security room, right? There's cameras are flicking around so you can actually see what's going on throughout the garage. We've reorganized how our maintenance team works. So now we have one person in charge of all three facilities that we have. And it's their baby to keep it clean and keep it organized. And so we're painting towers, we're replacing light bulbs, we're making things brighter. Um, we just did a whole bunch of landscaping at the at the downtown garage. Um, there's there's a ton of work going in to make these facilities safer and cleaner. And we meet with the hotels because the hotels are a big customer of ours. We meet with them quarterly around safety issues. And at our last meeting, they pretty much agreed anecdotally that, that things are much better than they were in the spring. So I think we're, we're, we're making impact, but it's, it's, it's hard work. Quick question, presumably a really dumb one. In the absence of gates, how do you charge people for parking? So you pay with Park Mobile, which is the app, or uh, okay. you can pay at the kiosk. And part of the change with the, when the, uh, what used to be the folks that work in the garage when they came over to parking services, we actually needed that staff now because they actually patrol the garage just like they patrol the streets. So the garage actually works exactly the way it works on the street. If you park your car on the street, you sort of guess how long you're gonna be there and then you put money in the meter. You go in the garage, you park, you kind of guess how long you're gonna be there and then you pay at the kiosk or you pay with Park Mobile. And then we go around, if you don't pay, you get a ticket. Fifteen. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions for Jeff? All right. If not, Jeff, thanks so much for hanging in there. I know we ran a little bit late tonight. Really appreciate it. No <laughs> Thank problem. you for the presentation. Yeah. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, and that concludes our uh, our MPA meeting for today. I know some folks had questions for uh, the parallel justice program. Thank you for staying later and uh, being available for that. Right. Oh, no, totally fine. Uh, well, thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night.